All right, thanks, Tony. It's important to talk about why these protests are happening. Not enough of that conversation. Joining us to discuss is Dr. Michael Fontroy, an associate professor of political science at Howard University. Dr. Fontroy has written multiple books on socio-political issues and his most recent op-ed, After the Uprisings, What Happens to Racism in Policing After the George Floyd Protest, can be found in the New York Daily News. First of all, thank you for waking up so early with us. I know it's no small feat, Dr. Fontroy, but let's get right into it. In your op-ed, you said that political decisions has led to officers not facing justice for his treatment of citizens. Can you explain? Absolutely. So around the country, there are a number of uh, local and state statutes that statutes that literally hold harmless poli uh, police officers around the country. In fact, police in America shoot and kill about nearly a thousand people every year and fewer than 1% of police officers are ever convicted uh, for, of any of, these, uh, any of these incidents. And what we know is that if you are a police officer and you can kill somebody on the job and not face a charge or not be convicted, then it really does remove any real accountability for, for your actions. And so from a public policy standpoint, what I'd like to see is a change in the kind of accountability that police officers face. I think if we can do that, then we can get to a place where you can build trust between communities. Uh, when you look at what's going on around the country, just think about all the names that, have, that we've heard over the years and how few charges or convictions we've seen as a result of that action. In, in America, in too many places in America, a police officer can kill a black man for virtually any reason. And if he's, he or she says, I felt threatened for my life, there's not a jury in the country that's going to convict. You know what, doctor, one of the most frustrating for frustrating things for me and I mentioned it at the outset is how little conversation is being had about this and how it's about the protesters and how the protesters are going about their business. How do you think the president views these protests with respect to his reelection? Is this useful for him? I, I'm glad you asked that because I actually think the president's pretty happy about this. And one of the, I, while I love the protests and love seeing people in the street arguing their case for change, the looting actually is a real problem from a sort of policy standpoint and political standpoint, because it provides cover and a diversion for everybody that wants to defend the status quo. So the president can now make the case, make the story about looters rather than actually about police misconduct. And so where, what I'd like to see is a, is a shift from protest to politics so that we can begin to deal with some of these serious um, and deeply entrenched issues. As long as the protests are going on, we're, we're not going to be able to do that because those who want to defend the status quo will just continue to point to the protest. Well, let's continue that. How do we go about that shift from protest to politics? What, what would be your prescription? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is keep in mind that change takes time and that if you really want to change the policies, you have to, you have to deal with the politics that, that are underlying that. So I, I sort of frame it like this. Politics results in policies that impact people. So if you want to change the, the policies, you have to change the politics that underlie that. And that leads us all to elections. Uh, you know, democracy is messy. It takes time. It's slow. It makes us impatient. But the reality is elections are help that help to put the people in place to set the policies that impact the people. So for me, it always begins at the ballot box, not just in the next election, but in every subsequent election. And I'd like to see people focus on being more deeply involved in the political process, paying more attention to people who run for office and voting their interests. You know, doctor, I'm going to talk in my final thought about the president's photo op in front of St. John's Episcopal Church uh, a little bit later today. And we just uh, mentioned that the last segment, but I got to let you weigh in. Can you get past the symbolism of the president gassing peaceful protesters so he could set up a photo op in front of a church with a Bible. So we've, we've kind of been here before, right? If you look at, the, the, you know, I think 2020 is, is lining up a lot like 1968, all right? With President Trump playing the role of Richard Nixon, who in 1968 was running for president on a law and order platform. I think that's where President Trump uh, announced yesterday, essentially, that he's now a law and order president. And the photo op that we saw yesterday for somebody like me, whose family has been in this city since the 1890s, 
and who used to ride on the 80 bus across town in front of the White House and has been to Lafayette Park and has stood in front of that church. My heart was broken yesterday, man. I got to tell you, because it just makes no sense to use innocent people and to use uh, police to engage in politics and, and photo ops. And I think history is going to judge President Trump very harshly for this. Uh, but he doesn't care. I think he just pretty much is focused on his reelection. But what I saw yesterday was heartbreaking. All right, Dr. Fondroy, thank you again so much for joining us. Make sure you check out his op-ed at the New York Daily News. Man, I had to catch you at a St. Albans football game or something, man. I'll be the other one on the other end of the field. <laughs> Looking forward to it. All right, have a good one. To get 